Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome back to another great Sunday School. God bless you, and we are getting ready to go. I just want to welcome everybody to our Sunday School class today, and I want you to share, like, love, uh, subscribe, and put on your notification button, and just join us in Sunday School. This is going to be the best Sunday school ever. We have so much to cover, and it's just going to be phenomenal. I want you to grab your Bibles, papers, pencils, anything that you can take notepads. And our very first one is Pam. Hello, Pam. You are number one. Oh, my goodness. Well, we're going to have a great time. I love you all. And I just want to let you know we have so much to cover until it is just not funny. So we are going to get going. And I see others are coming on. We are excited. Well, I'm not going to waste any time at all. I just want to tell you today is April 24th, Sunday, a day that we've never seen before. And I know my husband won't know this, but we're celebrating, surprise, his little birthday celebration. He doesn't look at this. He's too busy getting everything going. So if you get a chance, stop on by today and be a part of us. Okay. All righty. We're going to get going. And I just want to let you know that it is the something that we have to have in order to make it to heaven. And we're going to be covering a lot, and I want you to follow closely along with me. And I just want to tell you this. Jesus loves you! I'm going to pray, and I want you to just make sure that you... Uh, Type in what it is that we need. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask you to look on each and every one under the sound of my voice. Bless them that are coming on and those that have not come on yet. God bless those that are here. Thank you for the on-timeness, Lord. Lord, we ask you to bless them to retain everything that they have learned today and keep it for the rest of this week, this month, this year, and until you make your return. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let's see. Pam said, Holy Ghost. Oh, Mother Matthews, Holy Ghost. Robert, my cousin, Holy Ghost. Glenda, Holy Ghost. Oh, my goodness. This is wonderful. So we're dead on it. It is the Holy Ghost. All right, we're going to get going. I'm not waiting because that's when I get to go too fast, okay? Well, we're going to get right into our international lesson, and that lesson is God Frees and Redeems, and that is coming from St. John, the 8th chapter, 31 through the 38th verse, but we're going to be covering more chapters, uh, more uh, verses as well, other than in our scripture, uh, because it's going to just enlighten us on what we have to uh, uh, go over. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to be going over is, and I have some new glasses. I don't know whether these things got a glare. They look crazy to me. I almost feel like putting my other ones on. So if you get in a glare, say glare, and then I'll put my other ones back on. These are these uh, prescription online glasses. I just thought I'd just try it and see what happens. Okay, so God frees and redeems. Freedom in Christ Jesus. Uh, and we're going to start with the 8th uh, chapter and the 36th verse. And I want you to turn with me in the day. Whatever you do, get your papers and pencils out and be ready to take notes. Because what I'm going to tell you, you're not going to believe. And more on towards the end, really get to writing. All right. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. In the gospel, Jesus was setting people free from themselves. You know how you can just not just be bound up in a prison or by some, somebody, but you are imprisoned by your own strength and your own might and your own doing? Well, this is what he was saying. He was setting people free from themselves and their sins at the same time when the Pharisees were plotting to kill him. So he was doing good to all these people in the same time that everybody was trying to get him. And the background, when in the background, we talk a little bit about this. I'll be getting into that uh, leading into the lesson. 
And matter of fact, let's do that now. Let's turn to St. John, the 7th chapter, 37 through the 39th verse. This is a very important uh, scripture because this scripture is going to also lead us into our Kojic lesson. This is our international lesson. It's talking about thirsting and not thirsting as you would think of, but thirsting after your soul, after what you want from the Lord. And that's John 7 chapter 37 verse. Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me. And drink. Now, someone would think you're going to be giving everybody drinks of water. Mm -mm. 38th verse said, whosoever believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Spiritual life. That means what we just said, Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will flow out of their hearts. And they will speak truth. And you hear so many people, everybody, everywhere you go is talking about, we have truth. We are truth. You better be careful that you only know one truth, and that's the truth in Jesus Christ. I don't know one other person that these truth sayers have given their lives for anybody. These leaders were relentless towards Jesus and trying to trap Jesus and even brought a lady in the very act of adultery to him. They were trying to get him, tear him, tear him down, just try to say anything against the law of Moses. But Jesus was much too wise to do that, saying she should be stoned to death. Jesus didn't say a word. He said, I'm not going to talk to you. You're going to hear what I'm going to tell you. Watch this. And with all of what he did, Jesus didn't say one word. He wrote on the ground. Just imagine somebody writing on the ground, not saying anything. He, without sin, let him cast the first stone. They all went away knowing they had all slept with the woman. Hey, some of them probably that very night. But they were so into, let's make this the thing to bring down Jesus. He said, he who, with his, who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And so the woman, he asked her, woman, where art thou accusers? She said, Lord, there are none. Jesus told the woman, if your accusers have not condemned you, neither do I. Go in peace and sin no more. The accusers had all walked away in shame because every one of them knew that they had participated in the very act that they wanted to kill her for. But they were really trying to trap Jesus, trying to get, get him to go against the law of Moses. Okay, so now we're going to jump over to, and, and this part is, write this down, St. John, the 8th chapter, and the uh, 3 through 11. And that's where we kind of got all of that information. Uh, we should not judge. We don't know who God will save or use. So we have to be very careful. John 8 and 3 says Jesus was telling them about spiritual freedom. Some believed and some didn't. Demons will get in your head and make you think anything is right. You got to be careful that sometimes, look at Paul. Demons were in his head and he thought he was supposed to go around killing all the saints of God and persecuting them. But that wasn't, we got to be careful. There is so many false gods and uh, prophets and teachers. And they said the way we would know this was the last days, because in the last days, he said, many false prophets and teachers shall come. And everybody has got a religion. Everybody has got a word. Everybody wants to run. And God say, you did run, but who sent you? There's people prophesying. He said, you did prophesy, but I didn't put those words in your mouth. And we will have scripture on that in a few minutes and I'll tell you all about that. So we have to be careful that we don't get a zeal of God and just get, get all excited and I'm going to do a wonder for the Lord. You have to wait on the Lord sometime and just say, God, I want you to order my steps. I don't want to run ahead of you because you're going to run into a roadblock. You're going to run into an accident. You're going to have a collision. So be careful not to be this wonder worker. I just want all this 
to be able to do all this, do it every day, every day of your life. Tell somebody Jesus loves them. So when those demons get in your mind and telling you run ahead of God, you have to say, "Ooh, maybe I better wait on the Lord. If it's not from the a word of God, rebuke the thought out of your mind. Some listened, but didn't commit to, uh, uh, it, it didn't fall on good ears. You know, they heard, they listened, but it didn't fall on uh, soft hearts. Jesus said that it is not enough to just hear. You must believe and also be a doer of the word. Now let's go back to here. There were many voices, but God was saying, hey, you have to obey the one and only God. Now, Matthew the 13th verse, and I'm rushing through this really quickly, said about the planter. Do you remember he said by the planter, he said some seed fell on the wayside, stony places among thorns, and some actually fell on good ground. So, and it brought fruit. So don't get excited. You have to stay steadfast in the Lord. So what kind of soil are you providing for the Lord to grow in? What is in you? What kind of stuff needs to come out of you? There's a lot of us are just like half crazy. But we have to let God to work it out in us and just say, Lord, fix me. Even Paul had to sit and understand what the word of God was before he plowed out into the world being an apostle. Let's go to the eighth chapter now. We're almost finished with this uh, Kojic already. I mean, international. It, well, maybe about five more minutes of it. And it says, uh, 831. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. Indeed, you are my disciples, 100%. Don't stop. So many of us get going in the Lord, but we stop. We put on breaks. 31st verse says, and I'm going through the verses this time, ahead of time. Must abide, meaning continue to stay. Abide means to stay. A firm commitment. I've made up my mind. I'm not turning back. This is not a time for anybody to be turning back because we are living in the last days. Whether you want to believe it or not, whether you want to accept it or not, it is truly the last days. 32nd verse says, then you will know that the truth is the word of God. So when somebody comes to you talking about, I just want to hear truth, you're not speaking truth. Are you ready to defend your faith? Do you know how to defend your faith? Probably not. Anybody could knock on your door and tell you, let me talk about my faith, but they don't want you to tell them about your faith. You know why? Because they want you to be the one to surrender and come on their side. Now, when you get to talking about your God and you don't have anything to stand on, then you have to go back and say, am I prepared? The Bible said, study to show, this, to show thyself approved. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we have to be very concerned about, we must know the word, study the word. But even in studying it, don't get so filled up with letter, letter, letter. The Bible says the letter kill it, but the spirit makes it alive. Let me tell you something. You can get so much word, theologists and all of this, and I've been studying and I know you don't know anything unless the Lord brings it forth and reveals and brings it forth for you. When we go on our own and our own interpretation, we can very well have the wrong interpretation and leading people in the wrong path. So you want to make sure you know, study to show thyself approved. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's go on to the 32nd verse. Then you will know that the truth is the word of God. John 14 and 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. You can't get to God on your own. Oh, my goodness. These people just think, I got this connection to God, and I'm just talking to God, and he's telling me everything to do. Oh, I'm, I just got it made. But he said, no one comes to me except by 
no one gets to God except by Jesus. So we got to remember that there are not many paths to God. You know how many people said, oh, there's many paths to God. Don't believe it. It's another deception. It's another lie. There is only one path to God. And that path is through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, remember that you're going to hear people. There are many paths to our Lord and our God. Shut up. Anyway. All right. Jesus paid our sin debt on the cross. That was his payment. We can only live for him if we obey him. And I have a picture here. Oh, I don't know if I can even show this or, or if it will show if I turn it around, but I'm going to show try. You got to see what this. Oh, my goodness. Oh, this is just awful. All right here. I'm going to show you one picture. Can you see that? Can you see that? Oh, my God. This is what payment he gave. And I have another picture I want you to see. And I'm going to show you that one. We've got to quit taking the Lord thy God for granted. He has made it possible for us. And when you see this, this is going to break your heart. And Lord, please let it pop up on my screen. And I'm going to find it and I'm going to show it to you in one second. This is, oh, this is it, everybody. This is it. Now, this is what he did for us. Look at that. It will just think, my God, I didn't look at it like that. That is what happened to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why he is the one that can be the one that tells truth. Now, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I got to move that screen back over and get my other one back over in front of me. But this is the one that died for us. His truth frees us from slavery of sin. And by right, what you just saw lets us know why. The Jews resented him. They were just like, oh, hating on him, being told they were in bondage. Jesus told them, said, y'all in bondage. And he said, I dare you tell me I'm in bondage. Don't you know who I am? You ever see these people that don't you know who I am? Somebody like, I don't care who you are. Don't nobody care? People go on with that, don't you know who I am stuff. God don't care who you are unless you are a son of his. All right, the Jews resented God and told them, Jesus, that they were not in bondage. And the people don't want you to tell them that they are not saved because I know God. I know God. You know, you hear that too. All right, so the 33rd verse says, they answered him sarcastically. We are Abraham's seed and we've never been in bondage to any man. So how can you say that we shall be free? What are you talking about? Clearly they lied. These people had been in bondage forever. Did they forget or just they just wanted to just straight out lie? Because the Egyptians had them in captivity for 400 years in Babylon. And you think about 70 more years that they were in captivity and they were under Roman captivity right there where they were. But their pride and their arrogance wouldn't let them see that. And this is the way we are right now today. We don't want anybody to tell us we don't know God. Well, you're going to find out because we're going to talk about a place called Hades, hell, and the lake of fire down with the end time part. And this you don't want to miss. Don't be crazy and try to say something stupid, but you better learn all you can and get yourself right with God. Now, but their bondage, their bondage, like ours was and is bigger. It was the bondage of sin. This is what he was talking about. Yes, they were Abraham's seed, but they were not of Abraham because Father Abraham was not teaching what they did. They came to kill Jesus. Father Abraham was looking for the promised Messiah, not coming to kill him. So they were just all caught up in, don't you know who I am? We're the ancestors, we're the seed of Abraham, like you got your little plan right to go to heaven, bypassing all your filth and wrong and evil doing. God said, not so. He said, I come to set you free. This is the way we are. We think we can escape any kind of way getting to the Father, and we're going to go on our own. But God said there is only one, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. 
Oh my God, we are blind to the truth and we don't even want to hear truth. And when we hear it, we don't want to do it. So many of us are in bondage of sin and enjoying it. You're loving it. Oh my God, this sin is making you feel good. You don't, whatever the devil can tempt you with, whatever, he can tempt you with food, he can tempt you with your kids, he can tempt you with relationships, he can tempt you with power, you want to be this uh, uh, phenomenal person, but God says, come and be humble, humble is the way, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, that's the only way, some of you think you are right, but like my mama used to always tell me, Debbie, you think you saved? You ain't saved. You need to start all over and repent. Ooh, mama. Okay, your mama tell you that. And that's the worst part. She left it in a letter when she was dying. I was like, I've been saved. I'm saved. But she saw something about me that God may not have been pleasing. Only a mama. Maybe I would even rejected it if she'd have told me in person. But I never thought about that. But at that point in time, I realized this woman loved me enough to tell me something like this in her death. And I started striving more and more to get closer to the Lord and do what he wanted me to do. Quit saying you are not in bondage when you clearly are. Even those that confess to be saved, wait until those trials and tests come to overflow you. Then you'll be able to say, I'm saved. Will you stand or will you fall? You got to think about that. Will you wind up in a mental institution, suicidal, on drugs? Or just isolate it from everyone. See, the thing about it, when you get boastful in your righteousness, he said our righteousness is a filthy rags. Oh, my God. So I don't care how righteous you think you are. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. And you think about this. Don't let the devil fool you out of your soul with voices coming in your head. This voice told me to do this. This voice told me to do that. This voice told me to go that way. And you blame it on God. God told me. But I was reading. And each time he said, I did not tell you. You say that this is being done in the name of me. But I didn't tell you to do that. I'll give you these scriptures. The 36th verse. Now we're in eight chapter of... 8th chapter of uh, St. John, 36th verse now. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, that means you have been adopted. Ye shall be free indeed, absolutely set free forever. But you must want to be adopted. It's a free will. He stands at the door and he knocks. 37th verse said, Jesus said, I know that you are Abraham's seed, no doubt about it. That stands the reason. But you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. You don't want to hear it because you are doing what your father wants you to do. And he wasn't talking about Abraham. And you want me to be silent. You want me to shut up and quit talking all of this stuff. Because it's not making people look at you. It's got people looking at me. When sin has you, you obey that master. So you think you walking in God, but yet you being led by the devil. Jesus was implying that these Jews had a different father than God and Abraham and their actions were evil going against what they were taught. They weren't taught this, but the Bible said they went about to establish their own righteousness, not submitting to the righteousness of God. You did run, but who sent you? When did you get off path? What went wrong? Where did you get off track? How did your mind get so crazy that you feel you can just go and do this and go and do that? Or you can be this without knowing that is the true and living God. They said they, they had all these things out of their own imagination. God told me to do this. God told me, he said, and I have not told you to do that. So it's really funny how I was really reading this. True freedom is accepting the Lord Jesus Christ, abiding in his word, following him and being his disciple. He who the son set free is free indeed. That means absolute. I am the way, truth, and the light. Christ has freed us from the bondage of death on Calvary. Jesus is the only one that can break the bondage over our lives by us accepting him and abiding, meaning staying. 
staying in his word. How many of us are still crucifying Jesus all over? You have to think about this. We're crucifying Jesus all over. And uh, we have questions that were asked last week. And those questions were really some exceptional questions. Some of them were about where Nic Nicodemus was. I think Robert asked them. We had someone say, did Jesus go to hell? Now, wait on. Down towards the end when we get Q&A, I'm going to answer some of those different questions that were asked. Did Jesus go to hell? And did he, whew, on those three days, well, I'm going to wait and let you find out at the end. Now, let's jump over to our Church of God in Christ a lesson. Now, we understand that in this past lesson, they were trying to grip him up and turn him into a uh uh, a person that would go against the law of Moses, but Jesus was smart enough not to do it. But he knew these people were out against him. And when he stood up and this woman had go all this stuff going on with her, it was just so sad that they had all of this mess. Oh, my goodness. Well, we're going to keep it moving and we're going to tell you a little bit more about this. And i tell you this one thing. They didn't have any accusers left. Because they were all being bad. All right, let's go ahead. Kojic lesson now. And that's the woman of Samaria. We're talking about another one, woman. Why are we talking about all these women that's just been out there just having a ball, being sexed up? <laughs> so the uh, last one uh, was just sleeping with it every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Uh, but God set her free. And he says, where are your accusers? He said, go in peace and sin no more. He set her soul free. She got saved from her day. And her name was changed to, uh, I believe it was, Ver um, uh, oh my goodness. I can't remember. But anyway, it was changed to another name. And I will, Bertina, it was changed to Bertina. So that was the lady's name that was at the well uh, that Jesus saw. And they tried to say she was caught in the act of adultery, but God changed her name. All right, let's go on now to the little bit of this. God love, God's love and gift of salvation is for all people. You know how people said, oh, this is for me or uh, that's for them. God said, there's no division in this. It's for all people. Our memory verses, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Now, this is going to go in debate. How you going to never thirst if you drink of my water? Unless you're going to keep giving it to me. Aha. Okay. But the water that I shall give you uh, shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, that's when it really comes to a separation. We're not talking about regular water. We're talking about that water that springs up within our soul that gives us everlasting life. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. And you think about it, you can have that everlasting life. All you have to do is ask for it. And that's found in St. John 4th chapter in the 14th verse. Our lesson aim is this. By the end of this lesson, we will be empowered to know that we can change because of Jesus and share how our perception of others influences our actions towards them. They hated Samaritans. Oh, my goodness. We're going to get into that. We can't hate nobody. Jesus went there and set that thing straight. Little introduction about this. Uh, Samaria is located north of the Dead Sea and west of the Jordan. So it was like this middle country right in between. And the Jews and the Samaritan had a hate for one another. This is where Jesus met the Samaritan woman. So why was Jesus over in Samaritan country and he's a Jew? And he drunk from Jacob's well. The Samaritan and the Jews hated each other at that time. So it was not common to see Jews traveling through Samaria. You didn't see that very often. Jesus chose this route from Judea to Galilee. And why did he take him? Why did he even go through there? Took him through Samaria. But God does not discriminate. And this is what we have to remember. Jesus accepts all people, regardless of society and whatever social standards you might have. 
and welcomes them all into the kingdom of heaven. He does this. Now, we're talking about the woman of Samaria. Turn to John, the first uh, fourth chapter, 7 through 15. And then it jumps to 23 through 26 and 28 through 30. I hope y'all got that. All right, write that down. So now we're going to go in the fourth chapter and we're going to read some more. Today we're doing a lot of reading. A woman from Samaria, this is the seventh verse, came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The Samaritan woman said unto him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. The 10th verse says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who was saying, give me a drink. See how it's tying in the first and second lesson. The first lesson was talking about living water. He said, if you just knew who uh, said, give me a drink, you would have asked him to give you living water. And it was like, what? She didn't really understand. What are you talking about? The woman said, you have nothing to draw water from this deep well. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who made the well? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. So all of them was drinking from this well. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of the well water will be thirsty again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Now, we have to understand what that means for us. We are trying to keep ourselves. We are going on just being good people. But when something happens, we can go off the deep end. We can get mad. We can tell someone off. We can just fall by the wayside and just backslide. Or we could just even become hypocritical, just going in a way that seemeth right, but the end of that way is death. But God is saying he wants to give you that spiritual water. It will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is where we're trying to get to. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Well, she was confused again. It was not about drawing water out of that well. Jesus asked, where is your husband? Oh, now this is when it gets deep. Where is your husband? And when he asked her that, she said, I have none. He said, he said to her, you have well spoken. You have had five and the one that you are with is not your own. Was she sleeping with another woman's man or was she just, just not married or, or just in fornication? Nobody really know, but I know whoever she was with now was number six and it wasn't hers. She asked, are you a prophet? So that was one of the biggest places you could put somebody on that particular pedestal. The 23rd verse said, Jesus said, but the hour is coming and is now here. They had some long verses in these lessons. So y'all bear with me on these verses. When the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth, for the father is seeking such people to worship him. You and me, that's who he's seeking. He's seeking for us to worship him. The woman said to him, I know that the coming Messiah who is called Christ will tell us all things, but we're still waiting on him. Jesus said to her, I am he. Oh, I think I would have fainted. I am he. So she was like, huh? You know, she's a Samaritan too. And now she's like really puzzled. The 28th verse said, the woman left her water jars and went into town. She just like took off and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Oh my goodness. Can this be the Christ? Then they went out to see for themselves. So now everybody is like, is it the Christ? Is it the Christ? They've been waiting on him. Here they goes out here and they see Jesus. Many Samaritans in the 39th verse said, 
uh, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I did. So whatever she said, it was so convincing to everybody that they wanted to come and see who this man was. Now we're going to jump to the 42nd verse. They said, it is no longer your testimony that we believe, but we have heard for ourselves. Wow. Now I believe I've heard for myself. He is the savior of the world. I know he is now. I know he is now. Are y'all getting that feeling that he is the savior of the world? I had to read all these scriptures because it was bringing all that living water together from one chapter to the next. There is living water. He is the true and living savior. They said unto him, I believe now because I have heard myself. He is the Savior. And more and more believe. Although you had these opposing uh, uh, Jews that just, uh, they were they were priests and, and of the uh, house of God, but they were evil. They were critical and they wanted Jesus dead. And so it was. You saw me put that up on the board showing you the, the nails in his feet and his scars over his whole body that, oh, it's just too much even a bear. We must testify of the goodness of Jesus to draw people to Christ. Oh my God. We must tell how God has done something for us. Whatever you can do, lift up the name of Jesus. John, the eighth chapter and the 36th verse says, if the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free in Indeed, that means absolute. You don't have to wait around for somebody to make you free. The Lord thy God has already done it for you. You got to think about all what he had done for you. So now that's our lesson for the Kojic. So we've done the international and the Kojic. And now we're just going to sum it up by just saying he will give you that living water. All you have to do is thirst for it. Ask of him freely. And whatever you have to do, if you repent of your sins, don't just be hearers and hearing this every week, hearing it and never be doers. God is saying, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will take my yoke upon. He'll take your yoke. Oh my God. He is the one that you want to go to. Ask God to save you today and let God come into your life. Now, before we get going any further, I want to say happy birthday to you an anniversary and newcomers. If you're a newcomer, please put new on there. I sent out a little notice that says, welcome newcomer. So we're going to give you a lot of thumbs up. If you had an anniversary, put that down. If you had a birthday, put that down. And if you're a newcomer, we want some thumbs up. Sister Pam will uh, post on the board that you can be a part of our, our prayer list. And we will continue to keep you up in prayer throughout the week. And also, you can enjoy buying your own Jesus cards and passing out to everybody everywhere you go. So, that's what I wanted to get out. And I just want to tell you, if you want to be included in this prayer, you, I'm going to pray for you in about a second. And I just want you to know Sister uh, Cheryl Adams wanted prayer for her brother and her neighbor. So we're remembering them in prayer. So put down what you want and I'm going to pray. Uh, I'm going to be praying for your, ch uh, your children, your family, healing, finances, relationships, or whatever your need might be. You will be included even after the prayer ends. Just type it in. This prayer covers you. Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, most of all, I'm asking you to save those out there that do not know you, that continue to listen. They're hungering, they're thirsting. God, give them strength to stand up and make you number one before it is too late, Lord Jesus. Let them know that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Oh, God, do it for them right now. Let them surrender their souls to you, God, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, bless every sick person under the sound of my voice. I don't care if it's cancer, heart, kidney, whatever it could be, God. 
Oh, bless them, God. Heal them, God. Bind every demon that's trying to come against them. Heal relationships, God. Go into homes, God, and just fix the children, God. Turn their minds back to you in the name of Jesus. Don't let Satan steal our children. In Jesus' name, amen. We thank you. All right. We're going to go right into our end time prophecies. And right after that, we're going to be doing our questions, our Q&A. And I've been, I'm, we, we're going pretty quickly today, but yet I still got a lot to cover. So in the end time prophecy, this time we're going to be talking about false prophets. Each week we take a little topic. Now you want to grab your papers and pencils for real, because some things I'm going to say, you're going to say, uh, uh, it ain't that. And then I'm going to give you the scripture because once you study, the Bible said you will be a divider of the truth. And you will do it correctly. But you have to have that word in order to decipher what's what. Uh, is the Antichrist, false prophet, and teachers here today? That's what you want to know, probably. And I'm sure they are because it's the last days. Are you being deceived? Beware. Signs of the last days. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, 14th verse. We will no longer be carried about with every wind and doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive you. Write down Matthew, the seventh chapter, and the 15th through the 20th verse. And this is another scripture. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, they look right, they feel right, what they're saying seems right, but inwardly they are raving wolves. Romans, the 16th chapter, 17th through the 21st verse. First Timothy, again, also write that down, the fourth chapter, one and two. The last days, many will abandon the faith and listen to false prophets, and some will become them. We are reminded in Matthew, the 24th chapter, that the closer we get to the end times, the more false prophets uh, will arise. And I'm sure some of you out there have been approached by many people telling you that, you know, come this way, come that way. This is truth. You're not in truth. And they will get you and talk to you until they convince you. I'm telling you, run from these type of people. The 24th uh, chapter of Matthew says, when they were on the Mount Olive, uh, they said, what's the signs of the end of the uh, world, uh, Lord Jesus? This was his disciples. And Jesus, uh, and Jesus, don't let any man deceive you. That's what he told them. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. Some of you are being seed that have been in the Lord, that you know better. The 24th chapter uh, verse says, they will show great signs and wonders. Some of these people are going to be able to do. You heard of witchcraft, magic, and all this. Some of that stuff is so real and so because they are being provided with power from the devil himself. And you are believing it. So in reality, you're following the devil. Look at all those people in Jonestown that followed the devil going in the name of Jesus. Oh, my goodness. And Jesus, don't let any man deceive you, for many shall come in my name. And remember that. They will show great signs and wonders, and they would deceive the very elect, the real saved people that think they saved, like me, if, if he didn't soon shorten the days. So we have to stay prayed up and fasted up that God take away all that. So if you're not quite there, you can start listening to stuff you don't need to be listening to. And then it says, our culture is rejecting absolute moral truth and will, and like false prof, false words and loss, because this is what you want in your system, because they would rather believe a lie than the truth. Satan has planted many sails across the world and they are growing rapidly. I grieve thinking of the many souls that I've witnessed to over the years that will still be lost because they're ever hearing and never coming into the knowledge of the truth. What will happen when you stand before God? What excuse will you give to him while you rejected him? And you know what everybody 
say, well, when I'm dead, I'm done. Oh, they went on to heaven. You know what? They went on to the grave, and from the grave, they did go into a certain, and we're going to uh, talk about that. They went into a certain place, and it's not hell fire. It is either a place of torment or a holding place called paradise, waiting for the judgment to happen by God after the resurrection. Now, let me get to that. So I just opened up a can of worms there. The problem is these deceivers can over talk you, overpower you and come back at you from your very own Bible. But most of all, you don't know it well enough. You don't know it. You haven't studied it well enough. But see, it's the Spirit of God that really intercedes through you to make it come out right. You just can't come up with all this knowledge and think you know it all because you will perish along with the people you're trying to tell. They take that Bible's knowledge and they twist it to fit their own narratives and you are hooked. And like, what happened? Know the truth and the truth will make you free. Believe not every spirit. When they finish with you, you are shut down. Why? You don't know how to defend your own faith. You don't know how. The Bible says we perish for the lack of knowledge. But you have to be saved to know the word and get the right interpretation. This is really serious. You have to know the word and the right interpretation or you could still go off and be, see, be deceived. You learn a few verses and think you are ready. I'm ready to rock and roll. Let me go out there until they get a hold to you. But when they come at you, the devil himself, he confuses you and takes God's word and uses against you. All you can say is, duh, okay? They frequently pit the Old Testament against the New Testament because Satan doesn't want you to believe in Jesus. So they'll try to downplay the New Testament and say, but the law and the truth coming from the Old Testament, and they will come with, with every law that God came to improve and Jesus came to set you free through all of that bondage. Don't entertain these people. They will win. You will lose. You will lose your soul. Why? You are not fighting against the teacher, but Satan himself that have put them out there to draw you in. He's after your soul. The scripture in the Bible of 2 John, the one first chapter in the 10th verse said, if there come any unto you and bring you any doctrine that is not of him, receive him not unto your house. Don't let them come in and don't bid them Godspeed. Don't have nothing to do with them. If they are not speaking truth, which is Jesus died for your sins. We listen. Let these people invite us into their Bible studies, but they won't let you invite them into yours. They won't have anything to do with They're more serious about their gospel or, or 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 religion then you are of your own you will say well i'm gonna go with them this time no you don't don't even do it they will cripple you they are very discerning and cunning and clever and can tell you if you tell if you're interested in what they are saying and that's when they really go after the little weak ones your mind is just you want, what else? What else? Let me tell me some more. Run while you have a chance. Get your helmet of salvation and your shield of faith. Don't try to win this battle because you can't. You are not strong enough in the Lord to resist the power of Satan. Even people in the Lord, you are not strong enough to resist Satan's power. It will work against you. You are not strong enough. Stay away from it. Shun the very appearance of evil, as the Bible says. Uh, 2 Timothy, the second verse, the 23rd, second uh, chapter in the 23rd verse said, avoid foolish and unlearned questions. So when they start asking you all these questions and trying to get you, avoid it. It only genders strife. It only causes confusion in your mind. Elect can be deceived. I know some very prominent preachers that got caught up knowing all about God's gospel.
gospel and now said there is no hell. Oh my God, the deception, how it overruled a minister. But see, when we're anxious to be something, sometimes we start listening to any old thing. You better go to God and listen to the right thing. Romans 8 chapter 35 through the 39th verse. Who shall separate you from the love of God? Who shall separate you from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, and now catch this one, nor any other creature, a man, a person, trying to draw you, separate you from God, who shall do it, shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember this verse, and be ready to defend your faith. Be ready to defend your Jesus. He died for you. Those holes in his feet and his hands, and the, oh my goodness, the stripes that he was beating, his flesh torn all out for you. Nobody bringing you so-called truth did anything like that for you. Acts the eighth chapter. I mean, Acts the fourth chapter, the twelfth verse says, "Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Anything else is a lie, and the truth ain't in it. Don't believe it. Why do I keep telling you? I'm telling you, some of y'all right now sitting down entertaining." foolishness with people that are trying to turn you away from the real truth and you listening to that run from it get away from it i promise you you will thank me down the road for bringing this truth to you god had me dig up this and he said tell you because if you're in it and you continue in it you're going to be lost and i'm not even gotten to the good part yet on what you need to know romans is down in more in the lesson romans the first chapter in the 16th verse says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. You must believe. Don't knuckle under anybody in shame because you don't want to say his name or anything like that. The way to God, if you want to be saved, I will give you personal scriptures to read. Call me. I will tell you. I don't care. All I want to do is see people go to heaven. I don't want to see anybody lost. That's why I'm on here right now. Not for any other reason. I started off with the pandemic to give someone something. And God just said, keep going. People are saying, please don't stop. Well, maybe it is because you're hungry and thirsting after righteousness. Maybe God is plugging at people's souls that may never go inside a church. Well, you can accept Jesus Christ right now as your personal Savior. Romans, the 10th chapter, 9th and the 10th verse says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart, oh my God, that God has raised him from the dead, Jesus, thou shalt be saved. So we have a lot to thank God for. John, the first chapter in the 29th verse said, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He is God's son. He is the one that came to redeem us from our sins. I just thank God for what he's doing for us. And Jesus is called the lamb. John 1 and 36 to illustrate his gentleness and willingness to be the sacrifice of our sins. Now think about this. But he is also called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation the fifth chapter and the fifth verse to display his absolute authority and power over all creation. So he is a lion and he is the lamb. Oh my God. What a mighty God. Can, what is the characteristics really of a false prophet? I'm getting on this because this is what God told me to break this down. Last days is so much stuff I could swish over it. I've gone over it. I've told you everything. Now I'm breaking it down. We're on false prophets, prophets, teachers today. People that will deceive you, deceivers, people that will snatch your soul and you don't even know it. False teachers throw dirt in Christ's 
uh, uh, in the people of God. They are clever. They use clever language and appearance to disguise themselves. They come as sheep in wolves clothes. They strive to win people to their own opinions by winning debates. I'm going to argue back. He said avoid foolish and unlearned questions. They only gender strife or they will either pull you in. Now you're really lost. Think about it. They gain from their father, followers one way or the other. If they can't gain something, you might have money. You might have prestige. You might have power. Or just to say, we got all these people that are following us. Don't believe whatever the reason is. Jim Jones persuaded very prominent people to follow him. I'm just using him as one of the many, but now it's so many now until it's, and it's becoming more and more. Beware of these false teachers. They come in many forms. There's some are radical, some are sweet and kind, some are dominating, authoritarians. There's some of them are very meek and subtle. Some are friends, trusted ones, even family members that will draw you away from the love of God. Jesus said, abandon them all and lay down all you have and follow him to eternal life. Jim, Jim Jones was a leader of the People's Temple, a religious group in Jones John, uh, Jonestown, uh, Guyana, and he massacred all these people. It was 900 members of the group at their commune in Jonestown. These people weren't stupid. It can happen to you. Do you really think that it can't? It happened to them. All you got to do is start listening to the wrong voice. He said in the last days, these false prophets would come. You've got to get yourself together. This man was a faith healer. That's how he portrayed him. God said he was nothing. He was a liar. He was a deceiver. But he taught them like you know, and, and he taught against and he destroyed families. He pitted husbands and wives against each other, against how they, they might tell a husband, she needs to be submissive and she needs, and, and if you want two women, she should accept it. All kind of crazy stuff that is going on today. That's just a tink of the what's going on right now. You would not believe if you got into some of these little uh, extra religious cults that's going on. But if it's not lining up the scripture, run from it. Stop running after every winning doctrine because it sounds right, don't make it right. Point back to Jesus. Now, imitating the saints, that's what they are good for, imitating the saints. Sometimes it is very difficult, even for Christians to discern false prophets. There is a close resemblance between the true and false prophets. Jesus spoke of false prophets who show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they would they would deceive the very elect. Paul tells of the continuing Antichrist whose activities are in the last days. And we will see all of this coming to pass. Curiosity killed the cat. You have been warned in the last days these teachers shall arise in abundance. Don't believe them. Defend your faith. How? Long shall we halt between two opinions. If man be man, follow man. If God be God, follow him. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Now, we've done with that, and we're going to go right into our uh, few. We won't have Q&A like we would have it, but I'm going to answer a few of the questions that were put out. Robert, last week, Robert Taylor, last week says, how long was Passover? This answer was provided by Robert himself. He said it was in Israel, Passover's last for seven days, but I added on, but it has been celebrated for eight days by some of the Orthodox Jews. So it's seven days and possibly rolled over to the eighth. That's Exodus, the 12th chapter, and Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. All right. Then the second question was, when Jesus was in the temple, was he talking to Nicodemus? Uh, well, I came up with this. When was he, he, he was a priest 
He was a ruler. I'm saying Nicodemus was a ruler, not a priest. And I don't remember him being in the temple. But Nicodemus was an early follower of Jesus, uniquely mentioned only in the fourth gospel. That's John. According to that gospel, he was a Pharisee, meaning he was a Jew, and a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish consul in Jerusalem. And he was there. Now, another thing about Nicodemus, they want to know about his body. He went along with Joseph of Arimathea, the wealthy Jewish man that went and got Jesus' body. I know they could have just cried their eyes out seeing how bad a shape. They took that body together and put it in Joseph's tomb. Now, Gloria had another awesome question and that did jesus go to hell for three days now this is when it gets deep so we're gonna really fly through this because this was a lengthy answer jesus cried out uh, on the cross it is finished that's john 19 and 30 hope y'all scribbling this down his suffering was over there was no more payment needed for salvation jesus said Father, into your hand I commit my spirit, Luke 23, 46. Upon death, his spirit went to Hades, or uh, Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, and you'll find it in the Bible. Uh, it didn't go to hell. It says some in some versions, yes, he went to hell, but he went to Sheol, or Hades. Now, let me explain what Hades is. Hold this, and I'm like, what? What's she talking about? Definition of Hades. Another word for hell is Hades, but don't get confused. There are two sections of Hades. Let's like Hades is a big city. Let's use it like that to give you a vision. Hades is a place in which all the dead exist. When you die, you go to the grave. And from the grave, you go to Hades, a Shuel. Or you could go to hell or you could go to paradise. Now. Let's go again. Hades, a place for the dead with two sections, paradise and hell, that resides in Hades, like resides in Illinois. And here it is, Waukegan, and then there's Chicago. Okay, there we go. So those are two places. And Luke, the 16th chapter and the 23rd verse, in Hades, in is where the rich man, now I want you to know, y'all all remember this, the rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham afar away, and Lazarus in his bosom. One was in torment of hell, and the other in paradise, both in Hades, unless they wouldn't have seen each other. They were both in the place where the dead resided. Remember the rich man died and the poor man died and Abraham was already dead. But the resurrection had not taken place. So all of the people that died waiting on the faith, which is a whole nother territory, those were the ones that were placed in, 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 the, in the paradise section. Ooh, when I was reading all of this, I'm like, whoa, okay. Acts the second chapter in the 27th through the 31st verse. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption or he won't de decay. This is what Jesus was talking to his father. Uh, in Luke, the 16th chapter, 19 through the 31st verse says, Hades is represented as a place of torment for the wicked after death. But that's only in one section. Let's say Waukegan and Chicago is in Illinois. Illinois is Hades. I hope I made that real clear. I like to teach where you can kind of understand it. Revelation, the 20th chapter, and the 13th through the 14th verse, and it talks about Hades and fire. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged. So there's a judgment time coming. Every one of them according to their deeds. So whatever you doing, don't think when you die and you, you dead, you done. And you going on to heaven in a better place. Honey, it is not. I'm telling you the truth. Y'all better listen. It said the death 
Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire because God had come and spoken to the one that were in paradise and he took paradise and those on to heaven and only thing was left was hell. So now let's get to this point. This was the second death when they uh, cast into the lake of fire. What do you have to account for? What is it that God would look at you and say, uh, on your seat, to depart from me, I never knew you. You worker of iniquity, be thou bound hand and foot and cast into the lake of fire where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the skin worms never die, where there's falling throughout eternity. This is what you don't want to hear. But when you judge, you're going to be judged according to you. You're making your life history and it's going in the book. Also, Jesus promised the thief on the cross. He said this day, I will remember you in parable. Paradise, you will be with me. Paradise. He didn't say heaven because he had not uh, resurrected yet. So he couldn't take him there yet. He went into the grave. The moment he died, was able to preach to all the saints. And I think this is what Gloria's answer was. He preached to all the, the saints of old that died looking for the Messiah. They were residing in the section of Hades called Paradise. Now, I know y'all thinking, she is whacked out because you never heard this before. Because you don't study your Bible. And so it said the section of Hades called paradise where the souls of the righteous dead resided until Christ's resurrection. Paradise is now empty because he went back and he got those souls. He took those righteous souls out of Hades, out of the Illinois, out of the city and moved them and paradise. So those souls that were waiting, he took them out and paradise and he sent them on to heaven. On the other side of Hades, which I'll say is uh, Waukegan in Chicago, then I'm not going to say which one is hell and which one is <laughs> paradise. But anyway, it's all in Illinois. So that's Hades, okay? On the other side was hell, a place of torment. Now, remember the other place was a place of righteousness and goodness, and it was nice to be there, but it was a holding place. It wasn't heaven yet. Uh, but this is a place of torment where the wicked dead resided. Remember, Hades is a place for all the dead. Or Shuel, you will find Shuel, S-H-E-O-L, in the Bible. Until judgment. So they will reside there until judgment, meaning judgment time is coming. You're not escaping God's judgment. You're not just going to go sweeping through the city. They are still there. The people that died are still there. Y'all want to put every dead person in heaven. You better worry about getting your own self there. Remember the rich ruler I just said, they were far off. They could see each other, but they said it was a great gulf that separated them. And they couldn't go over there, and they couldn't go over there. But they were all in this one location, but one couldn't get to the other. The one said, oh, I torment in this place. Let Lazarus, which he was really mean to when he was uh, alive, put his finger in water and cool my parchment tongue because there was so much heat there. He wasn't yet in hell fire. And I was taking a bath this morning and stepped in that tub. Child, I thought I was going to jump out my skin. And I got out of there so fast, it was so hot until I started saying, Jesus, I don't want to go to hell. <clears throat> so anyway. It separated them. Now, let's go on down. Our time is up. All the souls walked the earth. Now, that's another thing. Did you realize that dead folks walked the earth with Jesus? All of those people that had come out and was taken out of paradise, who knows who it was? It could have been Moses, Abraham, uh, Jacob, uh, uh, Isaac. I don't know who it was, but it was a lot of them that walked the earth with Jesus. And let me just show you where it is in the scripture. It says, uh, 51st verse, 20, Matthew 27, 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. The earth did quake and rocks rent and the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And came out of the graves after his resurrection. Whose resurrection? 
Jesus, that's the 53rd verse, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many, many people saw him. Moses, Abraham, Jacob, no telling who was with Jesus, but it got their attention. These were dead men walking. Those souls were sent on to heaven shortly afterwards, and Jesus disciples witness him to descend, ascend up into the cloud to the heavens. Are you ready? Beware of false prophets. Only Jesus can do all of this. No one else. Don't believe and don't be deceived and do some homework. I want everyone to read Ephesians, the fourth chapter for homework. And I'm definitely over time and I'm cutting off right now. Are you gonna going to hell for somebody or something? Who's sending you to hell? Who's sending your soul to go to the grave and await in 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 Hades, uh, in a section for the wicked and the dead wicked? Don't let your election be sure. If you don't know Jesus, know him today. Is it worth it? Stay humble. Stay with Jesus. Everybody, get yourself up and go to church somewhere, wherever you are. Don't sit home and make yourself, your God. Go to the house of God. Now, I'm done. Hey, okay, we got through that. I was going fast and I am going to go back and I'm going to uh call all of my people. All right, we got Pam McKnight. All right, Robert, my cousin. Let's see. Sister Matthews, Mother Matthews, Glenda. Hey, Glenda. All right. We got Derek. Derek Roach. Latoya Buenos Dias. All right. Let's see. Tonette. Oh, my goodness. This is just Vivian. You're back. Oh, Vivian Garcia, my little friend. Oh, my goodness. This is great. Let's see. Who else? Cynthia. Tina. Tina Albright. Ah, let's see. I'm going fast as I... Shalicia! Shalicia. Who else we got? Vangela. Regina, my cousin, Chick, from Michigan. Oh, my goodness. This is great. Pam Wynn and Mike. Oh, my goodness. Pam Mason. Shut down. Hey, girl. All right. Let's see. Jacqueline Washington. Hey, Jackie. Oh, my goodness. This is great, great, great. Oh, my goodness. Johnny, my nephew. Hey, Johnny. Johnny Jones. Jeffrey. Changes good heal. Amen. Janice Roberts, you sound new, Janice. Come back with us. Motionique. Hey, Motionique. Oh, my goodness. Linda Coates and Mother Coleman. Oh, Cor oh Tisa, you made it, Tisa. I hope Julia is on. Uh, let's see. Uh, Lourdes, you're on. God bless you. Lourdes Garibay, one of our new members. Oh, wow. This is just awesome. Marcus. Hi, Marcus. Marcus Spencer. Barbara Holmes. Hey, Barbara. J Jennifer and James. Another cousin. Lily. Another cousin. Barbara Holmes. Oh, my goodness. Uh-oh. I lost my... I knew I was going to do that. So, anyway, I lost the whole thing now. <laughs> oh, they're, they're back. Oh, my goodness. All right, who else do we have? I got Gloria Live. Christiana! Hey, girl, you made it. All right, now you know my screen jumped off, so I wasn't able to, I don't know. Chantel, I see you, Latrice Lockett. All right, I think I got everybody. Uh, Oh, Tabitha, Marie, Cricket. Oh, good thing I went back on. Y'all know I don't know what I'm doing on this thing. It jumped off and I got lost. All right. Uh, uh, let's see. Pam, May oh, I said you, Pam. We got three Pams today. 
All right, I think. Uh, oh, Michael Hargit. Hey, Elder Bishop Hargit. How are you? I am just too excited. Oh, my goodness. Y'all have made my day. Well, I am off to church, and I advise you to go too. I love y'all, and I'll see you next week, and we're going to dive into a little bit more of the end time prophecies. And I'm trying to get it within my hour, but it's seeming like it's just going over no matter what I do. After I call my names and everything, it just get wild. Ah, Linda Irvin. I see you, Linda. Okay, God bless y'all. See you next Sunday and bring a friend. And remember to go to Your Friend Ministries, not Your Friend Debbie. That's facebook.com slash Your Friend Ministries. If you go to Your Friend Debbie, then you're going to be on the wrong one. And by the time I get it uh, shared, you've missed some of it. So I'll see you next week. God bless you. Bye.